why energy is the biggest investment opportunity that we have today. Now, price is easy. It's easy. You break it down with supply and demand. And we're looking for a mismatch in supply and demand. That's our edge. And we are seeing one of the greatest mismatches in supply and demand that we've ever seen. Man-made, if you will. Now, I've been talking about energy. I've been talking about the world going into an energy crisis for over two years. Um, I've been breaking it down for you, but I am sitting down with one of the energy industry's biggest experts, Josh Young. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk about the supply and demand. We're going to break down all the supply of energy that we have and make a case why there's no more coming, at least anytime soon. Then we're going to go through all the demand side so you can understand exactly how big this mismatch is. Of course, then we are going to get into how to play it, how to position, what type of companies you should be looking for, what type of multiples, what type of sectors, and so much more. It's a complete playbook, what you should expect from energy moving forward, supply and demand, and how to play it. You do not want to miss this interview with Josh Young. It was an amazing interview. I learned a lot. Get out your pen and paper, and let's go. All right, Josh, <laughs> here we are. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to jump into this. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, thank you for having me, Mark. So, uh, yeah, we were just uh, talking about uh, our mutual friend, uh, Cuppy, that uh, got us connected. So shout out to, to him. If you're not following him, uh, you should check him out on Twitter at, at, uh, at Cuppy. I guess that's his handle. I didn't look it up. But uh, you're, you're the, uh, the, the energy guy, right? The oil, the natural gas guy. I, that's where I saw uh, him talking about you a lot. And so I'm excited to dig into that um, today. It's obviously a hot topic. Um, I want to talk about this from, I was kind of thinking about talking about from two sides, right? Supply and demand. And there's things that affect the supply. There's things that talk about the, uh, that, that affect the demand. But first, let's talk about, uh, here we are at the time of this recording, uh, just going into the midterm elections here in the United States, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, potentially a really big election. We'll see what happens. But um, we're at, uh, going into this election where we have, you know, inflation is the hot but button issue here. Um, seems like energy has been driving the inflation. And we have the Biden, well, we have Biden himself. I'm not going to say the admin, but Biden himself. And the rhetoric that he has, the talk that he has, it almost seems like he's angling for some sort of a nationalization of the energy industry. Uh, not to jump right into the politics of it, but are you picking up on that? Do you think that's kind of what's happening here? Or is it just like uh, trying to point the blame, deflect bl blame for the midterms to maybe say that, you know, it's not my fault why energy is so high? Yeah, I think I think it would be shocking if the U.S. nationalized oil and gas producers. So I don't think I'm not sure what he's doing exactly. And it does seem sort of like he has different speech writers and different policy analysts who are pushing him in sort of opposite directions. So it's like, we're going to shut down fossil fuel companies and oil companies are price gouging produce more right now. So there's, there's a very obvious sort of conflict there, but I don't, I don't come to the nationalization uh, angle or aspect. And, you know, that hasn't happened in the U S uh, in any industry in a long time. And I think it would be, I think other than from the far left for certain industries and the far right for other industries, I think it would be shocking and, and not acceptable to the, the broad, um, to the broad voter base and to the, to the country to, to nationalize an industry like energy. So you've seen, I think it was just this week, a lot of Dem lawmakers have come out calling for it. Um, I made a video, uh, on my channel talking about, you know, the diesel situation and I was completely shocked by the amount of comments. I mean, from my audience <laughs> who typically wouldn't be from that side of the aisle, I was shocked at the amount of comments of people saying, that's why we need to nationalize it. That's why we need to nationalize it. So we had Dem lawmakers come out and talk about it. There's some growing consensus, I think, because of this rhetoric of the imposing these record profits. I agree it's an uphill battle, but, um, so it's not anywhere on your radar. You don't see that as a potential risk out there. I think it's very unlikely. That that reminds me of the discussion um, pre-Russian invasion of Ukraine, but, but right around it, um, there was uh, some discussion of a potential oil export ban. And um, you know there were a few sort of famous analysts and uh, market commenters who were starting to talk about it and predicting it as a likely outcome. And there are just there are some logistical and um, sort of international relations aspects to that that made it very unfeasible. 
And in a similar way, uh, nationalization, expropriation of oil and gas assets, it just, it just doesn't, when you think about it for a minute, right, you hear it and it's shocking, but it just doesn't work, right? Like what you're going to have federal employees run oil fields. Um, I mean, it just doesn't, uh, you know, federal employees struggle enough with law enforcement and struggle enough with administration of programs that sort of run themselves. Um, and you look at how the TSA works and how much they had to outsource from that. And, and again, like just how simple and small that task is, right? Preventing weapons and explosives from going on planes. That's, yeah. that's a very small task. Uh, exploring for, delineating, developing, and maintaining production of oil and gas fields is an enormous task that is well beyond the, the means of, uh, and well beyond anything that the federal government does. And there's a reason yeah. why uh, nationalizations tend to fail, and there's a reason why the U.S. has uh, privatized almost everything and kept things private for, for decades yeah. now. Of course, I agree with you 100%. And of course, I agree that it would be a complete disaster. And we can just look at Venezuela to see how that would turn out, right? Uh, they're not competent to run this. And so I would agree with you. Um, doesn't mean they don't want to try. But um, just, you know, when we're looking at, you know, investing, um, I typically think of longer term periods. So I'm just trying to kind of think of like potential risks and stuff like that. So I thought that's a hot button issue. We talk about that. But if we if we look at this and, and I guess like frame this up. So you have Bison Interest. Um, that's a fund that focuses on the energy sector. Is that right? Yeah. And so um, do you is your fund kind of positioned long term? Are you looking two, three, four years out? Or are you kind of doing short term trades or kind of like what's the thesis or the view of that fund? Yeah. And importantly, none of this is an offer or a solicitation. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Of course. And, and not, and there are no investment recommendations and anyone hearing yeah. anything on this should consult their own investment advisor. Yeah. Thanks for that. Sort of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Any sort of investments. Um, but uh, so, so we launched Bison in 2015. And uh, so slightly long answer to a short question, but I think it, it, it addresses it sort of more fully. Um, we launched Bison in 2015. Uh, because the price of oil fell dramatically from the 2014 highs of, I think, roughly $120 a barrel down to the low in early 2015 of, I think it was around $29 a barrel. And so uh, large cap oil and gas stocks were down about 50% in that time and small caps were down about 80% in that time. And so our thought was that over a multi-year period, um, that sort of re-rating would lead to oil and gas stocks recovering and maybe they wouldn't recover fully, but if you're down 80%, if you get back to only down, let's say 40%, you could double or, or more. And so um, there was really this interesting opportunity and the thought was that it would be a pain trade where we'd own things and buy them cheap that were well run and well underwritten and unlikely to go bankrupt. And if they went down, we'd buy more and eventually um, the reduction in supply from the stocks being down, which meant the cost of capital for the businesses, their availability to reinvest was down. Um, eventually, that would lead to higher prices and higher share prices. So <laughs> we thought it yeah. would take two or three years. And so far, it's taken seven. And yeah. um, I think I think that should continue to play out over the next number of years. Uh, it taking longer meant that this downturn obviously was more extreme, but that also means that the undersupply of oil and gas is more extreme, which should lead to much higher prices, as well as it taking a lot longer for the supply base to recover. So yeah, uh, yeah we're, we're very long-term oriented, uh, but, but not sort of forever married to this in the sense that you know there's likely to be a point where oil becomes adequately supplied and then eventually oversupplied. And so we're, we're here for this under supply situation, uh, transitioning to sort of closer to normal supply. And at that point, we, we likely sell and return capital. Yeah, great. Yeah, I just like to clarify that because uh, a lot of times I when we talk to people, I always want to try to clarify like what time periods we're looking at, because a lot of times like I had two bond guys on bonds are the worst thing in the world, bonds are the best thing in the world. And then they disagree. But when you talk to them, it's like, well, what time frames? Are we? <laughs> and then there's more agreement there. But so if we jump into this, let's let's talk about some of this uh, supply and demand. If we start on the supply side, um, we have OPEC, <laughs> right, which is a, a, a big piece of that supply. Um, 
We have G7 nations now calling for them to produce more oil. We, you know, Biden went over there. Supposedly it wasn't to talk about oil, but um, we think it probably was. I guess let's start with um, the spare capacity. I know it's something that you talked about. What do you think that their possibility is to really expand the amount of oil they're producing? Yeah, it's funny. I, I just gave a speech at a local law school here in Houston, actually, last night about this. Uh, it was uh, interesting sort of going through the, the history of uh, claims about uh, OPEC capacity. And actually behind me, I have the uh, Matt Simmons Twilight in the Desert book, uh, which was, I think, one of the original popular claims uh, about Saudi Arabia potentially running out or having much smaller reserves than they were claiming. Um, yeah. So what we realized last summer was so a year and a half ago roughly was that uh saudi and others were not reinvesting sufficiently to likely be able to sustain their projected production levels and so um that meant essentially that they were overstating their spare capacity and likely also overstating their ability to grow their production over the medium term so I wouldn't say that Saudi Arabia is out of oil or that Russia is out of oil or that various other OPEC or OPEC plus countries are out. I think it, it's less about that and more about there being a capital cycle that's necessary in those countries to be able to get to the level of production they claim they can get to and then to be able to grow more than that to be able to meet likely demand over time. So I think it's sort of the, the spare capacity issue is about what can you bring on in the next month that can stay on for six months. And then there's another issue which Matt Simmons addressed, which was, are they out? Like, are they are they tapped out? Are they done? And it's they're, they're both complicated questions, but I think it's important to distinguish between the two. I'm not necessarily a peak oil proponent. I'm more of a peak cheap oil component uh, proponent. Right. So I think there's there's oil out there to be found and to be developed and be produced, but it requires a lot of time. It requires expertise and it requires capital. And after a long uh, time of starvation of those things and after a lot of qualified people, talented people have left the industry and with very few coming back in, um, you know, there is this period that we're in that's similar to prior periods after long downturns where it's going to take a lot potentially to get the activity necessary to get the production that we need from these countries. So uh, it's not this uh, peak energy like we like the whole world was operating on that you, they can probably bring more on, but it takes a additional um, CapEx investment and it's going to take time. Uh, how much time does that take? Let's say that they said, hey, hey, uh, G7, you're asking us to produce more oil. OK, we'll do it. We need to invest money. We, we have the money we need. Is this five years? Is it seven years? Yeah. So uh, it depends on the kind of field, but anywhere between three and possibly 10 years. And maybe even I saw one estimate of 12 years, which also actually it might sound like a lot, but it makes sense. So if you think about the typical offshore field, um, an offshore field that doesn't have infrastructure built to it, a, a new discovery, a new field um, can take up to 12 years from having that as an idea to you know running the the seismic so you you run a, a boat with a bunch of um, seismic measurement devices behind it and you dro drops explosives and it sort of measures the si the using uh, essentially seismic measurements it, it sort of maps what what's down there uh, from a resource perspective as well as sort of what the the rock structure looks like and then with that done you identify specific drilling targets and then bring in a drill ship to drill an initial exploratory well, and then that's evaluated and tested and studied. And then additional delineation wells, if there's a big discovery are drilled to sort of map out the size of the prize. And then development wells are drilled and production facilities are installed. So again, all of these things, I mean, each one of those steps could take a year or more uh, between deciding you want the rig, hiring it, moving it there, having it drill the well, and then testing, and then you know the next step. So, so conceivably, some of the discoveries like this offshore Namibia discovery that Total just achieved earlier this year, I mean, that could take 10 to 12 years to go from that initial discovery. Well, may, maybe because they already drilled the initial well, maybe it's eight years, uh, but it'll, it may take a long time to get from that initial discovery to substantial production from that field. Uh, the Guiana stuff started in 2015. So here we are in 2022, 
we know it's a huge field and production's just starting to come on. Uh, you know, I think Hess and, and Exxon combined, I think they're producing 500,000 barrels a day or something from there. It will eventually be 3 million barrels a day, but that's going to be over the next five to 10 years, let's say, that they'll get up to that. Um, and when you look at the amount of declines worldwide, you really need to be adding a Guiana a year and we're not. And so, yeah. Um, so yeah, it could take a long time to get that supply on and it's going to take a lot of capital and a lot of that capital isn't even being dedicated to it yet. So I like to say the clock, it hasn't even really started yet in terms mm -hmm. of that, you know, let's say three to 12 years to be able to get substantially more production online. Yeah. I mean, like you were just talking about, they're seven years in and they're barely at 500,000 a barrel a day or whatever. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's a long time. Well, I want to come back to that CapEx piece in a minute, but let's keep going down the line on some of these supply issues. So uh, with OPEC, they're probably not going to be able to rapidly expand their production at least for a number of years. So not a, new, a lot of new supply coming there. Yeah, that's, that's right. And then okay. I mean, there's some complexity there, right? So uh, some production's offline because of sanctions or because of local unrest. Uh, some of it's uh, maybe going to come online because Saudi Arabia, for example, is ramping up local gas shale production, and that might be burned and offsetting some local consumption of oil. So there could be some small amounts of incremental production. But to really move the needle, um, yeah. I think you need a lot more investment and a lot of time. Even in Russia, right, if, if peace broke out, which I would love, right, I mean, it would be wonderful for people to stop dying in Ukraine. Um, yeah. But if peace were to break out, it may take several years just to re-engineer and fix some of the likely problems that have already occurred in Russian oil fields. And so that then the clock's ticking there where the longer they don't have access to Western services, the less they're reinvesting into their fields, the longer it's going to take for them to be able to bring fields back on and to be able to get them back up to the production levels that they were at before the war. Yeah, let's talk about the Russian oil fields for a minute. Um, you have uh, on one side, you have uh, Peter Zion saying that uh, if they don't get this oil out of the ground, it's going to back up to the wellheads. They'll have to shutter them in. Once they shutter them in, it could take 20, 30 years to open them back up. Um, then you have the permafrost and all these other issues. Um, I've talked to Bloomberg about it, and he says, he said, uh, you know, he, Zion says hey, they don't have the, the, the manpower, the technical ability to do that. Um, the, the big uh, service companies have left. Um, Doomberg is like, come on, you don't think there's other people in the world that know how to service it? That's absolutely not a risk. And sorry if I'm putting either of those on, in, the wrong, in the wrong statement. I guess where do you fit on that? I guess you're saying you're already starting to see some of that happening in Russia. Yeah, so I think I'm somewhere in the middle there, and I, I like and respect both of them, and, and they have yeah. uh, expert views in some things. Uh, that, that I wouldn't even dream of, of arguing with. Th this I'll argue with a little bit because I have studied it and connected with a number of people that have been actually active in these fields and in analogous fields. And um, I don't think the sort of permafrost extreme oil production collapse scenario is very likely at all, um, but we're already seeing production start to fall off. And so what I would point to is less production collapsing and more that production in Russia was already declining quite rapidly and required significant reinvestment in order to bring on new production to replace production that was declining. And the new production that was coming on was very technically challenging and demanding. And so without access to the latest and greatest Western technology and uh, service providers, um, they're, they're not achieving the same efficiencies and they're not achieving the same production levels. So it's less about collapse and more about what we've seen in other fields and in other places where similar sorts of things have happened, even without as extreme sanctions. So again, you look at uh, Venezuela, you look at Mexico, you know, not huge changes and still, you know, when you nationalize, you kick out foreign services companies, you, you don't necessarily see uh, your production fall off day one, but over a few years, I mean, Cantarell, I think it went from 2 million barrels a day to 500,000 barrels a day over a eight or some so year period. So, you know, there there is that significant progression. And if you're starting with Russian oil production at, let's say, around 11 million barrels a day, maybe you're at 10 now, and maybe you get to eight over the next couple of years, it's not, it's not the sudden collapse. It's not this backing up process. I mean, they, they certainly have the people to be able to restrict production from existing wells. Like, I'm, I would not argue with that. I think it's just a question of 
sort of what does their development look like over time? And then what does their uh, maintenance, what are their workovers, what are some of their other activities look like over time? So I think I'm somewhere in the middle on that. And again, there's already evidence of production already starting to roll over in Russia, but I just wouldn't expect it. It would be very surprising if Russia was able to continue to produce at the levels they were producing right before the war. And it would also be surprising if they were producing 3 million barrels a day, let's say using Peter Zahan's number, uh, ar around one year after the start of the war. So again, somewhere in the middle, maybe it's a million, maybe it's 2 million barrels a day. But again, less of a collapse and more of just a reduced ability to replace uh, production that, that naturally declines. If uh, if peace isn't um, isn't found soon, and we go into this multipolar world um, where you know we have oh, you know whatever the BRICS nations on one side and the NATO nations on the other, for example, um, do you think this decline in Russian capacity will continue to uh, continue will continue to go down without access to the expertise of the people on the NATO side? Yeah, I think I think it's a real issue. Um, and for every person that says, oh, there's there's plentiful, let's say, Chinese OFS, uh, right. oilfield services uh, expertise and technology, I would point them to uh, oil fields in Mongolia and Inner Mongolia and various other places where those service providers are active. And I mean, it, it's one of those things that really bothers me about the U.S. and sort of Western environmental movement where... I know what's happening in those fields. I've seen pictures. They're not mine, so I, I can't share them publicly, but it's it's horrible. The, there's environmental absolute catastrophes going on in those fields, um, and there's no protest. In, in Mongolia? Right? Because, in Mongolia? Yeah, in Mongolia yeah. and various other places. I mean, it's just right. horrible. right? And they're producing, let's say, 20% of their production capacity, um, but they consider it great, right? Because if they went from zero to 200,000 barrels a day in a field, that's wonderful, from their perspective, even if the production capacity might be a million barrels a day, uh, if you look at the extra cost and the time and who they have to bring in, if none of those are appealing, then maybe they don't make those investments. And so bringing those service providers to Russian fields that have been actually very well operated, uh, like Sakhalin and so on, I mean, you could really see uh, substantially lower production relative to what people are forecasting. And, and frankly, I think, I think Putin knows this because uh, what he stepped into um, in terms of how disastrously the USSR was running their fields pre, um, you know, pre reopening uh, of, of Russia, I mean, it was, it was pretty bad in terms of how they used to develop their, their old fields as well. So, you know, I don't think I don't think that the Chinese services companies are the, the ones you want to go to to be able to sustain production. And you know, I think I think there are real issues. Again, that being said, it's not like they can't bring production on. It's just likely to be wasteful, likely to be less productive and likely to take longer. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, I think uh, most people would realize that uh, the Chinese are <laughs> well, we won't get into that. Um, OK, and let's keep going down the line then on the supply side. So then. Um, we have, you mentioned Venezuela. So, or we, we talked about Venezuela, I guess, when we were talking about the nationalization. So Venezuela, um, what arguably some of, maybe one of, if not the biggest oil reserves in the world, they used to be a major oil producer nation through some nationalization process. Maybe if we have that political picture, right. Um, they've declined now. They can't seem to get oil out of the ground. Um, it seems like the 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 reality of them bringing those large oil fields back online is not very strong. They don't have access to the capex. They don't have access to the people. Uh, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, again, I think it's one of these really weird political things where we're very pro certain elections. Oddly, um, you know, America, our, our current leadership, and other Western nations are. And we're very anti other election results. And so we did a very poor job of supporting the person who actually won the last election in Venezuela. Um, so there's a very complicated political situation there. Um, and there's also a very complicated labor situation and equipment situation and compensation for services provided. And so, you know, production has increased a little bit in Venezuela, but there's also many, many problems and obstacles that prevent production from rising much more than, than we've seen. And in a situation, so, so I'm, I'm an optimist and I, I think that things in general are better when everyone wins. So 
I, I actually would be very much in favor of and very happy to see if tomorrow Maduro's regime fell and Venezuela was run by, um, you know, uh, capitalists who wanted to grow their economy and reopen it and, and redevelop it. And th there would be some production that would come on over the course of, let's say, five years from then. But there's not very much more oil production that would come on over the first, let's say, 24 to 36 months. There's lots of issues with their infrastructure. There's lots of stuff that's been cannibalized. It would take a while to capitalize it, and it would take a while to actually get sufficient investment and development done. And what everyone forgets, I think, so they, they forget this about Iran too, um, it would be wonderful, both from a Venezuela perspective and an Iran perspective, for oil demand if these countries were reopened and if they were able to sort of have their economies revitalize. And when you look at the likely production versus likely consumption, both in Venezuela and in Iran, it would take probably until about five years in before they'd be able to produce more than their incremental consumption from the reopening. And again, just in terms of total human suffering and total like the world being a better place, it, it would be a much better place if there were uh, more sort of classically liberal regimes uh, running yeah. those countries. Yeah, and I certainly agree with that. Um, it's a big if, right? If uh, the Maduro regime could be re replaced and we get to a capitalist system again, that's a big if. And looking at the whole way all of Latin America is going communist right now, that if is looking further and farther away at this point. Um, okay, uh, let's keep... You, you mentioned... Uh, you mentioned geopolitical risk, Iran. Uh, so there's problems with Iran, potentially Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, does that affect the output, uh, the supply side in Iran and Saudi? I mean, I guess if something erupts or is this, dis is this geopolitical risk already disrupting that amount of in uh, oil being put out? So, so Iran already is producing less than they could. And there's some debate over how much more production they could bring on. But there are very large fields there that are not being uh, properly developed using contemporary technology. And so I, I am optimistic that they would be able to bring on substantial additional production. It would just require a lot of reinvestment. And again, they have actually, they have a large populace that was very well off prior to <laughs> some recent misbehavior and sanctions and so on uh, yeah. by their regime. And so there, there is the potential for them to, to grow production, but also grow demand. Um, what I think you're referencing, though, in, in addition to that, so there's some constrained production that, that's constrained essentially politically um, and would take a little bit of time to bring on. Um, but there's, there's a sort of uh, uh, Cold War-ish between Saudi Arabia and Iran that occasionally uh, goes hot. And, and it seems like some current threats about that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. There have been recent threats. There have been headlines, um, depending on the delay in between when this is recorded and when it, it uh, yeah. comes out. Who knows? Maybe there will have already been something yeah. <laughs> that, that will have happened. And I joke, but obviously I hope that no one would get hurt. Um, so the the thing that I think is important to understand here and why this is, I mean, it's a very important topic. It's great that you asked this. Um Everyone, I think, is a little bit complacent on this because uh, Saudi's oil fields were attacked, I think it was in 2019. And that was a, a time where the world was uh, slightly oversupplied with oil. There was still this bubble going on in U.S. shale development. And uh, there was just there was more sort of short term high decline supply that had come on than there was demand. So so prices were suppressed and the world was adequately or oversupplied with oil. So in that time. Uh, Iran via, uh, I think it was Houthi proxies out of Yemen, uh, they attacked uh, Saudi oil fields as well as Saudi processing facilities, and they temporarily reduced Saudi's uh, production and oil processing capacity. And almost without a beat, so oil shot up and then crashed over like a roughly two or three day period around that. And uh, through inventories that Saudi held elsewhere, they were able to essentially bring on additional oil to market and essentially suppress the price increase uh, from the additional risk from that attack. And so right. I think people look at that and they get the wrong lesson. They look at that and they think, oh, Saudi has essentially unlimited production capacity and unlimited inventory and would be able to bring on enough production to be able to essentially safeguard the market if something happened. My right. takeaway is, the world is very different right now than it was in 2019. 
And in an, under, in an undersupplied market rather than an oversupplied market, if there were to be a similar sort of disruption, especially with Saudi inventories much lower today, both locally as well as their, their holdings internationally, um, th there's a real risk that we could see materially higher prices in a very different reaction. So I think, I think energy analysts are sort of jaded having seen what happened. I think the market's jaded having seen what happened. But what happened then doesn't mean that it'll have the same consequence as what could happen if Iran were to attack again successfully. Okay. And then uh, the last one I have here on the supply side is to the United States. And uh, let's leave the politics side out and just look at the potential. Um, so I've seen some people say that uh, fracking is tapped out and the wells are declining. Um, other people say, no, you know, we have more technology. We can, we can, we can find new wells, et cetera. Um, where do you look on just the supply side of the United States and our ability to continue to produce um, at, at current levels or increased production? So I think we need to invest a lot more in our services capacity as well as in exploration in order to be able to grow U.S. production from here. So certainly in at least some shale oil fields, well productivity is declining. It's not growing. And in other fields, well productivity seems to have flatlined, which is usually the precursor. It's like if you throw a ball up in the air, it uh -huh. goes up fast at first and then it slows and then it yep. stops and then it falls. So there's yep. like this moment where it's flat and, you know, it doesn't stay with gravity, doesn't stay very long with uh, well production and uh, well productivity in an oil field that might flatline for a while. Um, and then fall, but very rarely does well productivity flatline and then rise more. And mm -hmm. so, and it has to do with the degradation of core inventory. Companies almost always drill their best wells first, which yep. means the wells that are left after they drill their best wells are less good. And then they drill the next best and then the next best and so on. And so technology improves, but the rock quality declines and absent new discoveries, you end up with this sort of treadmill or worse in field and well productivity. So the way that shale combated that, the way that these producers combated that and were able to grow was by adding drilling rigs, by adding completion crews, and you know, by increasing, by using technology well to increase well productivity uh, to overcome the high decline rates from their wells. And again, what we're seeing is that in many, if not most of these fields, they've already peaked and well productivity is falling or they're peaking and well productivity isn't rising. So again, just the, the trend seems to be that we're, we're plateauing for US oil production. And again, what you need to do to solve that would be to build a bunch more drilling rigs, to build a bunch more pressure pumping, to build more pipelines, to hire a lot more people and provide all the different things in the supply chain. And you know we're, we're not quite there yet. Services costs have risen a lot, uh, but we probably need another sort of step change up. And I think to get that capital, you need much higher oil and gas equity share prices. So that's like part of why I'm so bullish on the equities is that they, you really, it's not just about oil price, you also need the equities higher but you'd also probably need much higher oil and natural gas prices such that the companies can lock in those prices and be able to guarantee services companies multi-year contracts such that they can go raise the capital to be able to go get more rigs and pressure pumping and other services equipment built. So there's sort of this chicken and egg and <laughs> neither have happened quite yet. And both of them need to happen substantially more, both much higher oil and gas equity prices and valuations, as well as um, much higher prices, as well as uh, much higher returns for drilling, which requires higher uh, oil and gas commodity prices. Mm. So the central theme is that uh, this happens very slowly, and it requires lots of capital and lots of long term planning and thinking. And so if we want to affect the supply side, we need to think long term, and we need to, and we need to invest lots of capex, and it doesn't happen quickly. Right, that sums up the supply side, and we don't, and we don't see, uh, we don't see uh, any new big chunks of supply coming on. If anything, it looks like we'll be kind of hovering here or dwindling down unless we make those big investments and and invest that time. Yeah. So there's actually one other place we should talk about very briefly, which is okay. uh, Brazil, 
And so, okay. again, ignoring the political aspect. <laughs> but you can't. At, yeah, how do you ignore that? But yeah, you just uh, you just do because the the yeah. technical aspect is fascinating, and you, you see how it's like either going to be bad or worse from a supply perspective. So there's been a relatively free market oriented uh, president there, uh, and there's now a potentially contested election, um, and either the incumbent is going to stay or there'll be a, a left-wing president who had you know been running the country previously um and either way with this relatively uh right-wing or sort of more free market oriented president that they've had um oil production in brazil has disappointed every year and i saw this one chart years ago which showed petrobas's forecasts uh, for how much they were supposed to produce and how much they were supposed to grow versus how much they actually grew. And every year they forecast like 10 or 20% growth. And I think the IEA and others um, had those forecasts in their models. And every year uh, Petrobras would basically have relatively flat production or their growth would come in much lower than what they had forecast as well as what international agencies forecast. And Petrobras just reported and lo and behold, their production numbers missed yet again. And so it's important to remember that when you think about all these different places where we hear stories about discoveries, we hear stories about success in oil fields. And it's not that Petrobras and not that Brazil, uh, from an oil perspective, isn't highly successful. They're extremely successful. They're just not growing their production in the manner that everyone's expecting. And actually, they came out with a negative number. They, they shrank their production a little. Mm -hmm. So that's worth noting. It's, it's less of a Brazil-specific story and more of a story of increasing difficulty in getting oil out of discovered fields, as well as limited exploration activity and, and few fields that have been discovered that are more productive than the fields that we're currently aware of. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm trying to set this up for everyone that's just listening right now. Like, uh, price is always supply and demand. So I want to look at the supply side. We don't see any new supply coming on. Uh, if anything, we're kind of flatlining and probably going to be dwindling down. Um, if we could make massive investments and improvements, but it takes a long time. So then we want to look at the, the demand side. If demand stays the same and supply goes down, then we would expect higher prices. I mean, if that's a very elementary way to look at it. So if we look at the, the demand side of things, then... Um, your long-term thesis on demand is that, uh, humanity is still going to need energy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, for some reason, humans are still going to want to drive and transport things around the world and something. Yeah. I mean, when you look <laughs> at world demand for oil for the last 40 years, approximately world oil demand has grown by at least 1% a year. And there's yeah. always bad things happening and there's always a scary story and a negative story. And, um, you know, I, I always think of uh, Peter Lynch when I think about this, where he talks about how uh, more money is lost in anticipation of downturns than is lost during actual downturns uh, mm. because people miss the, the gains from being in the market over the long term by being out of it because they're worried about a potential future crash. And yeah. so, um, you know, there have only been a few years where oil demand has been off from that 1% annual world growth rate. Uh, one was, I think it was 2009. I, don't, I think even 2008 was fine. I think it was the, the economic, the knock-on effects of the, um, of the financial crisis. And then uh, during and immediately after COVID. And so right. what you saw in 2009 was by 2010, you were already seeing world demand growing to catch up with that sort of long-term 1% plus global demand growth trend. And what it looks like we're seeing post COVID is the same thing where we're seeing, they call it revenge travel, they call it whatever they want. Um, even with sort of sketchy EIA numbers, even with whatever, you could just see enormous uh, travel, uh, boat, you know, planes driving, uh, hotels have been pretty heavily booked up, restaurants are busy. And, and so you're, you're seeing this demand recovery uh, for transportation and that translates to oil demand. And then I think what you were alluding to also is that when you get to certain uh, wealth levels in emerging markets, as you get to sort of $2,000 per capita uh, GDP, you get people starting to drive scooters and other sort of basic hydrocarbon uh, powered 
uh, devices to, to get them to their products to market it, to get to work, to, you know, drive more people around sort of the equivalent of uh, taxis or Ubers or whatever. And then at $10,000 a day, uh, or sorry, $10,000 per capita GDP, you start to see more people own their own cars, you start to see traffic jams and, uh, and, and those, those demand trends are actually somewhat uh, unlinked to year-over-year -year GDP changes. So once you're over $10,000 per capita GDP, it kind of doesn't matter if you're at $15,000 per capita GDP one year and then $14,000 the next year and then $17,000. Like it doesn't, the path actually doesn't matter much in terms right. of increasing consumption. So demand looks really good because there are a number of countries that cross that threshold during COVID, shortly before it, or crossing it now. And you're just, you're seeing emerging market and frontier market demand grow in a way that I think international agencies and sort of like woke corporations are really struggling with. Um, they're shocked to see that other people want to live in a manner similar to how, how we are living. How dare they, how dare yeah. they want to live that. Um, when we look at that, and then if, if we look back through you know, the last 100 years, we can see that as uh, we've used more and more energy and we've used different types of energy, it doesn't actually decrease existing. So we bring on nuclear, we bring on uh, renewables, it doesn't decrease the amount of hydrocarbons that we use. So I, 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 put, I tweeted this out the other day, it was a, a clip from, was it Squawk Box or whatever, I forget, the guy from Goldman, and he was saying... Um, we spent what three point eight trillion dollars on uh, renewables, and we brought the fossil fuel consumption from eighty two to eighty one percent. But he said it's probably worse than that now because now we're going back to coal. <laughs> now we're going back to burning fire. We're going back to coal. So when the numbers probably readjust, we'll probably be higher than the eighty two percent or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of like so. I guess when we look at the demand side, if we think about you know this EV revolution, we're going to spend another. Now, what they're calling for six trillion a year to push into that—not EVs, but uh, renewables—and um, then potentially now there's this push to bring nuclear back on. But you don't see that as really putting a dent in the demand that we'd have for hydrocarbon fuel, oil, and natural gas. Uh, not in the short or medium term. I think in the very long term, it's entirely possible. And especially if uh, some of our friends are right on their oil price predictions. So I have my uh, cuppy yeah. uh, WTI two fifty hat uh, on my desk, and uh, you know. To the extent that oil goes to a price that's shockingly high, I do think that we'll start to see demand actually transition from true demand destruction. Um, but but that does look quite different than what I think alternative energy proselytizers and politicians and policymakers are really trying to push. It just you end up restructuring society to some extent. You end up pushing innovation and new technologies and new new mechanisms for demand. But yeah, it's very, very difficult. Um, you know, Alex Epstein does a good job covering this. Before him, uh, I forget who authored it, but there was this great book I read at the start of my career, the, the Bottomless Well, which also talks about it, where essentially the more efficient you get at using energy, the more you use, not, right. not less. So yeah. um, it, it sort of helps explain, I forget which Scandinavian country it is, but one of them, their EV adoption is very high, and yet their per capita oil consumption has not dropped. <laughs> so it, it, it makes you wonder what the rush is to try to push electric vehicles if their inputs are very polluting, but then yeah. also they don't actually destroy oil demand. So um, yeah, I think, I think longer term there is that risk, especially price driven, but I think a lot of the predictions of this is going away by 2030, this is going away by whatever, a lot of those are likely not to be followed through with and and there are just physical limitations to to executing on those now let's bring it back uh, more shorter term over the next year um we have uh the fed jerome powell saying they're going to crush the economy they got to crush they're, they're committed to stopping inflation uh jerome powell said what three times i think in the september presser pain 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 people need to expect pain need to expect pain they were out this week with the FOMC meeting as well. Again, he's uh, trying to, we're going to crush demand, crush demand, crush demand, which um, basically make everybody poor so they can't afford to travel and they can't afford to go out to eat and can't afford to drive their cars, et cetera. Um, what do you see? I mean, can they really, do you think they can crush demand to the point that it brings the price of oil down? Because, I mean, they could 
they could slow the demand. We don't drive as much, but then the supply could also be decreased to offset that, right? And th th is, that a bat is that a battle they're engaged in, and can they win that battle? Uh, I mean, they've, they've said directly that they're not really trying to affect the price of oil or the price of energy because they say that's out of their control. Um, I think you bring up a really good point in terms of supply where if you raise interest rates, you're raising the cost of capital and you're reducing capital investment. So, um, you know, I really, I mean, I'm a University of Chicago trained economist. Um, I actually decided to go to the University of Chicago because when I was accepted and I visited, there was a symposium in honor of Milton Friedman. And I got mm. to hear Milton Friedman and Gary Becker and five other Nobel Prize winning University of Chicago economists talk about incentive theory and sort of how, you know, what it meant when Milton Friedman sort of figured it out from a theoretical perspective, as well as how it applied to their work. And so... You know, I'm, I'm very biased towards Milton Friedman, and there are these great videos of him talking about central bankers from 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And he, he made this critique where the Fed is always wrong and they'll never admit it. And they just go from being wrong one direction to wrong another direction. So yeah. um, I, I think they're making an enormous policy mistake trying to fight a supply shortfall by killing demand. And I think they're really hurting the most vulnerable people. And it's just a, a horrible policy error. Um, that being said, they can be effective in the short term in crashing the economy. And so they may be able to force oil prices down in the short term by really crashing the US economy as well as crashing international markets through sending the dollar uh, up on a relative basis versus those other currencies by creating uh, sovereign debt crises in a number of different countries. So they can do that in the short term, but the very likely outcome of that would be them turning around and printing rapidly and enormously, which would then send prices much, much higher. So I try to be positioned conservatively. I'm not in the camp of, hey, I know where oil is going to be in a week, a month, a year. I don't know. I just know that to balance the oil market, we're likely going to need much higher prices for a while. And the longer oil prices stay low, the higher they need to go and the longer they need to stay high in order to be able to balance the market. So again, like I don't know that anyone really knows what's going to happen with the economy and with demand. And that's sort of where I, I lean more towards supply, where it's more predictable and less towards trying to predict uh, shorter term demand, because again, there, there are some unknown unknowns that just make it very, very difficult to forecast. Yeah, I mean, not, there's no such thing as certainties, obviously, um, we have probabilities, but I think the most probable outcome is probably what you've just, uh, the Fed is always wrong, and they whipsaw and they air to the either side, right? And so they're probably trying to crush demand, they'll probably go too far, and then they're going to have to try to offset it. And actually, he Powell said it in the presser, he said, uh, we'd ra the risk is uh, not doing enough, we'd rather go too far, because we have the tools to rebuild it later. And I'm paraphrasing it, something to that effect. And so he kind of said that, like, Let's just break it. We'll, we'll pump it back up later again. Um, but then we have like a situation, and, and this is, uh, I think you had uh, retweeted Cuppy's uh, little meme about um, uh, President Biden saying, uh, if uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't pu push oil to 300, I'll push oil to 300. And I think the kind of thing is, is that uh, I think about as well is that nations around the world are having a problem. We saw, you know, Germany, for example, go from being a net exporter to a net importer because the cost of energy has gone so high. Now they're being forced to try to, not just Germany, but Japan, et cetera, trying to force to um, protect their currency, but also import energy at the same time, which is a very dangerous situation to be in. But then you have a situation with like Saudi Arabia, which is like, do they want to sell all their oil output that if they have limited supply, as we've already kind of covered, do they want to sell all their output at 70, 80 bucks a barrel for dollars that are just going to be pumped and manipulated down? Or would they rather sell less oil at 150, 250 or 300 bucks a barrel? Seems like a logical question that you would have to kind of ask, right? Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see... Um I think it's really interesting to see journalists and other sort of uh, analysts who don't have any investment in the oil and gas space, and uh, so they're not owners, talk about how no one wants oil prices to be much higher than $90 a barrel or $100 a barrel. Yeah, or right. <laughs> and it's ludicrous. You can tell there, there's just this fallacy there, which 
it, it's like if you owned an apartment complex telling someone telling you that no one would want rents to double <laughs> and it's like well no right. i want rents to double because i own an apartment complex so right. there's there, everyone understands that everyone understands that apple would like phone prices to double because they sell phones and yet somehow they think that oil is different and that oil producers who own their production wouldn't want prices to be a lot higher and so there is there there are there are a set of people who are um agents and not principals. And that's, I think, some of where you saw the shale boom and bust and where you've seen other sort of uh, bad decisions made in the industry. And one of the nice things about the downturn, and you know, there were very few nice things, it was really devastating and many people lost their jobs and so on. But one of the nice things about the oil downturn is that on the back end of it, there are many more principals and there are fewer agents. And there are more barriers to agents misbehaving and so management teams are being held to account. They're being forced to where they're trading at too high of a cost of capital to return that capital um, and not to overinvest and grow production uneconomically. And so, yeah, I think I think there's a good chance that you see OPEC behave similarly. And it's it's less about them trying to spike the price and more about them trying to balance the market. And if they see attempts at destroying demand, there, it, it's quite rational for them to preemptively, proactively cut supply in order to sort of match that. And so we already saw that, especially with their limited capacity to produce. If you can really only produce 9 million barrels a day comfortably in your Saudi Arabia, why on earth would you produce 10? It just doesn't make any sense. And we pointed that out. And you know, I might be getting those numbers slightly off, but just directionally, yeah. I think it's indicative. And so lo and behold, here they are producing, I think they're down 600,000 barrels a day, month over month. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if they cut another 400,000 barrels because they just don't want to produce that more. They'd rather hold some in spare capacity or at least not be overproducing from their fields. Similar for other parts of OPEC. And also I think Russia, I think they're, they're reinvesting uh, intelligently and they're trying to limit their declines um, while at the same time uh, limit their declines in their production capacity while at the same time allowing production that's hard to fight hard to keep on allowing that to decline off to some extent and restricting some of their wells so yeah I think I think this is sort of a natural process and I think uh, Biden and other sort of G7 leaders messed up on this I think they just didn't understand what was going on from a production and field perspective that would make OPEC inclined to more proactively cut production. So it's both economic, like you were saying, as well as there's this technical aspect that makes them even more inclined to cut and makes them even more inclined to cut from here. So even though they cut quotas by 2 million barrels a day, they're still, they're still significant quotas well above uh, their current production levels. And I, I think, they, those come down potentially with almost any excuse over the next few months. Yeah. I mean, it's just basic business sense. If you're selling something that you have a limited supply of, you're going to want to sell it for the most amount of money that you can. And uh, I'd rather sell less of it for higher dollars than sell it all out at a, at a very low price because it's a limited supply or, or fixed supply. So it just kind of makes sense. Now, if, if we if we jump to then, um, okay, so we, we've kind of framed up the supply side, and the problem is, is that we can't get a lot of new supply on without ex a lot of CapEx and a long-time perspective. And that seems to be a problem. We hear uh, Biden, again, we started out talking about this, I'm thinking this rhetoric towards nationalization, but basically saying that uh, bring the price of gas down, you're greedy, you're, you're too many profits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then, you know, we're seeing that these oil companies and specifically when the gas prices, the refinery is saying, look, we're not going to invest more money. It takes us 15, 20 years to make our money. Why would we invest that when you say you're going to shut us down, et cetera? And so we kind of have this ESG attack now. And the ESG attack is limiting that, in my opinion, seems to be limiting the amount, uh, the ability or the, the want to reinvest that money because of that long term perspective. We don't have that. Um, it seems like that's been a very big problem. I mean, Biden came in saying he wants to shut them down. Maybe the ESG narrative seems to be starting to fall apart. Maybe that's my optimistic, <laughs> my optimism bias showing. Where do you think ESG fits into this? And what does that mean for uh, energy prices over the next couple of years? So, so there was one thing you said in there that I think is actually uh, – 
I don't know. I would think that ESG would go away to some extent just because it's so uneconomic and it's restricting investment that's necessary to start the clock to be able to get the world oil market sufficiently supplied. But there's one thing in there that I think is even more interesting that's worth focusing on for a second. So the world refining market is actually not undersupplied. And U.S. refiners are partly not investing because there are onerous environmental rules and taxes, but they're also partly not investing because there are giant refineries that have been built or are in the process of being built in various countries around the world, and there's actually sufficient refining capacity. There's not sufficient transport capacity, and some of that refining capacity is in Russia or other countries where there are trade limitations and other issues, but there's not it's not uneconomic to not reinvest in refining today when you look at it from a multi-year perspective rather than from a short-term perspective. And that matters a lot for oil because when you look at the net price people are actually paying per barrel to consume oil right now, it's not the 80 or 90 or whatever dollars that you're seeing on your screen right now. It's actually 150 or $180 a barrel, which is sort of if you look at your gasoline price, your diesel price at the gas station, I mean, the, the price is much higher that people are paying. And there's always some amount of profit for the gas stations and for the transportation and so on. But the, the net price is quite high. And so as refining capacity comes on, and as refined products are delivered, more oil is, is being used. And so we saw that China, for example, their, their refinery intake is much higher right now than it was two months ago. So as more oil is used uh, to refine, um, to get refined products to deliver them, I think there's a decent chance that you see a shift in price from higher price on refined product, higher margin on refined product, to higher margin and essentially higher price on oil. Because we're seeing all the current demand for oil products at this essentially, let's say, $150 or $180 per barrel price for oil. So if the refinery margins go from, let's say, $50 a barrel to $20, there's a reasonable chance that you see that $30 a barrel uplift seen on oil, especially because it's getting cleared through refineries hitting higher utilization levels. So again, I know that sounds a little weird, but basically high refining margins today, I think lead to higher oil prices tomorrow, not necessarily higher refining margins tomorrow. Hmm. So we have enough refining capacity, but it's in uh, countries like Russia or other unfriendly countries that we can't really use. So technically we don't have the refining capacity. If well, will. again, from a world perspective, we do. And, um, you know, I think China's refining capacity at one point earlier this year was down 3 million barrels a day as they turned off their teapots and as they turned off. So their smaller independent facilities and as they lowered their quotas for even their large refineries. So as those come back on, those directly affect the oil market and that helps them locally as well as it helps their their exports. And same is true in various other countries. There's a large project going on. I think it's in Saudi Arabia, but it might be in one of the other uh, Gulf countries to, to bring on substantially more refining capacity there as well. And I think there's a few other projects. Uh, we did a short study on it, realized it wasn't that interesting as a white paper and didn't publish it. But um, you know, there, there is enough capacity and it's not just in Russia. And so I think uh, I think it's you actually see it in the refiner equities where uh, people sort of shout that the refiner equities are too cheap. But then you look at the likely earnings for them over a multi-year period and, and they're fine. I mean, they're a little cheaper than they were, but it makes sense when you look at it in terms of if you were thinking about building a new refinery, that the numbers don't they don't tie to they don't make sense to, to try to go build uh, with current uh, onerous regulations and taxes to try to build a new refinery, even if you get it approved on the Gulf Coast, uh, when you consider the international project. So again, there's there's a lot of sort of political discussion around that, and you know the politics are certainly not helping. But there's a whole other economic aspect, and that's relevant because it matters for world oil demand, where demand is actually probably higher and probably less price sensitive than people think, and that's sort of being obscured by a number of refineries having been offline, including, I mean, there's refineries in the U.S. that are off because there were explosions or fires. And as those ramp back on, you could see considerable additional demand for oil in the U.S. just as those refineries start consuming yeah. more oil. 
it's certainly a messy situation. You know, now they're running at max capacity. So now maybe there's more accidents happening. They don't have the time for the maintenance required. In California, where I'm at, they've shut down several refineries. And now we don't have enough refineries because they've shut them down. And we require a different blend of gasoline because of EPA regulations and whatnot. Plus, and so uh, there's all these little different markets and stuff that, that are within that. Uh, one more thing I want to jump on, and we'll talk about this one just quickly, but uh, natural gas. And now natural gas in the United States has been t- sort of like this byproduct of the shell revolution that we've had in the last, you know, whatever, 12 years or so. Um, and basically, I mean, still even today, I believe it's just being flared off and vented, not even being captured. It's a lot less today than it was, but we had it so cheap. Um, but now we've been trying to export more. So we see the price of natural gas in the United States versus the global price of natural gas is a massive difference. And I don't know where it's at today, but... Um, somewhere, what, 6 and 35, or I don't know, 4 and 35, something like that, whatever it is. Um, As we start exporting more natural gas, supposedly we're trying to help offset what's been lost over in Europe, et cetera. Um, Do you think over the next couple of years, or how long ever you think it's going to take, if if we export enough natural gas, does it reset the U.S. natural gas price to the global natural gas price, and Americans might see the price of natural gas go from whatever, 6 bucks to 35 bucks or something? No. Um, no, <laughs> I think uh, there have been some misconceptions around this. That there's a huge difference in North America between natural gas and oil. Um, oil is hard to produce. There is limited resource to produce it from. And the incremental cost on producing it is escalating dramatically. Uh, natural gas is plentiful. Um, there are many, many known resources that are highly economic at, let's say, $7 natural gas. Um, if it were to stay flat at $7 for a while. And then as services costs rise, maybe that number goes to eight or maybe nine, but the, it's the equivalent of, let's say, $300 oil. So when you think about sort of what, what that means relative to where prices were in the U.S. three years ago, I mean, there's just there's so much resource and, and there, there are limitations on services, but as you get to that higher end for natural gas prices in the U.S., you just you open up so much resource. Um, I mean, just in the, you know, you think about Oklahoma and all these different natural gas plays that were discovered and all this different rock that people know is there. They have the infrastructure built out and there's really like half cycle or quarter cycle economics to actually go develop it. So, no, I think I think you'd need to build way more LNG exports than are being built or are likely to be built along with dramatically reindustrializing the U.S., which isn't happening to the scale that you would need, along with reindustrializing Mexico, which is happening and is very exciting uh, for that country and for the people there. Um, but even with all of that, I, I think it's extremely unlikely. You could see days or even months with really high prices for natural gas if there's extreme weather or other sorts of supply disruptions. But no, I think I think that's a, a super unlikely scenario. And I think it's easy to get sort of caught up in excitement in various things. And so I think it's, it's a very uh, important point to distinguish the dynamic for natural gas prices in North America versus um, versus the, the price for oil and the likely dynamic for those two. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks for addressing that. All right. Last topic. Um, and again, uh, to reiterate your disclaimer, and you can say it again as well, but this is not investment advice and then you don't need to name any names, but for somebody who's interested in, in this and says, okay, I see the supply demand um, e- equilibrium is off. I think this is a good investment. Um, you mentioned equities many times. Um, I mean, do you like um, you like equity type plays? You like, I mean, you, you do like a, a factor of them, service companies, actual oil itself, futures, et cetera. Like, where do you look for gems or bargains or um, ideas? I guess. Yeah, I think it's a good question, right? So, if you have an idea which is, uh, and you're able to analyze it, so you see that the world oil market's undersupplied, and you see demand is likely to rise over the medium to long term, and so you're interested, you see that the price is probably disconnected from the fundamentals. There's a a strategic petroleum reserve release that's been happening that's inherently temporary because there's a limited amount of oil there uh, that can be released. And and you see there's not enough investment. So so I think that's a it's an interesting starting point. Um, I'm more focused on the oil and gas producer equities and to a lesser extent, the services companies. Uh, I'm interested in the smaller cap ones because um, I think in general, when you look at the, the history of oil and gas, you see the producers and the services companies trade at much higher valuations uh, over time 
in up markets, so in situations where the oil uh, supply is insufficient and likely to be more insufficient. Um, so you look at the 1970s, you look at other periods that may be similar to what we're experiencing today, and producer equities did very well, oil services equities did very well. And then what I've noticed is that the small cap producers are trading at huge discounts to larger caps. So if a typical, let's say, mid cap producer that you might have heard of might trade at, let's say, six times EBITDA or cash flow, uh, you might see a small producer trade at, let's say, two or three times EBITDA using the same assumptions on oil price and natural gas price and the same assumptions on services costs. And then on the services side, same sort of idea where you can buy services companies that are equipment intensive at a fraction of the replacement cost. Frankly, you can buy some oil fields at, the, at a fraction of the replacement cost too. That's one of the measures I use to figure out if these things are actually cheap or not. And historically, buying services uh, companies like drilling rigs or pressure pumping or so on um, into a recovery, if you buy them at a big discount to their book value or replacement cost, and then wait until they start earning a lot of money, uh, they, they might still look cheap on a cash flow basis, but historically that trade has been one of the most profitable and consistent trades in history for oil and gas equities, and frankly, for the broader uh, stock market, finding those sorts of things. So historically they've done very well, and those are sort of the two areas I think are really interesting. And just one, one extra sort of aspect of that, I think um, low decline oil producers um, in the public market, as well as some of the smaller private assets, um, the market doesn't seem to have caught up with the fact that services costs are rising a lot. So there are low decline producers that trade actually at a large discount to high decline producers um, because they're small, because people don't understand them. And those are very interesting because if you're a low decline producer, let's say your production might only decline 10% a year if you didn't reinvest versus a shale producer, maybe your production would decline 30 or 40% a year if you don't invest. And so that matters because if it costs twice as much to use a drilling rig next year as it does this year, because service costs are higher and labor costs are higher and so on, um, if it costs twice as much, you only need to reinvest, let's say 10 or 20% of what you're making. So if, you, if the cost doubles, maybe now you're reinvesting 20 or 40%. If you're a company that's reinvesting 50 or 80% of what you're making to be able to keep your production flat because your decline rates are so high, if services costs double, then maybe you have to stop reinvesting because it's not economic to do so. So that's part of the equation of why oil prices probably need to go a lot higher. But it's also, I think there's a big advantage in being able to analyze these companies and see sort of which ones are advantaged in this situation and which ones, even if oil prices go higher, maybe don't win so much either because their valuations are high and or because they're too service intensive and the inflation they experience might be higher than the price inflation they benefit from on the product they sell. All right. All right. Good, good info. Good, good place to start to go dig out some uh, gems for yourself if you believe in the uh, energy thesis as I do and obviously as Josh does. I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up with that. Uh, that was a lot of information. I had more questions I want to ask, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll wrap it up there. Um, at Josh underscore young underscore one is your Twitter handle. You put out a lot of good information. So if you're interested in energy, you should definitely follow him on Twitter at Josh underscore young underscore one. And check out bisoninterest.com is his website, um, which has a really cool story of the bison, by the way, why you chose the bison name. And uh, everyone should go just check out the website just to at least read the story on the bison. I didn't know that piece. Um, maybe it stuck out to me because uh, we were watching that show, what is it, 1863 or whatever. It's like the prequel to the uh, Yellowstone or whatever. And uh, they had this, uh, a tornado came through and uh, all the animals started scurrying. And so it kind of made me think of that. So go, go check out bisoninterest.com and read the story on the bison at least. Uh, anything else you want to shout out, Josh? Nope. Uh, I, I really appreciate you having me on, Mark. This was great. Okay. appreciate it. All right. We'll wrap it up with that. Thanks so much. All right. That's a wrap. Hopefully you learned a lot with this interview that I did with Josh Young. Give him a follow. We have everything linked down below so you can learn more about what he's doing. It's a big trend and it's only going to get bigger. It's something that I am positioned in right now. And I think you should as well. So check it out. Uh, hopefully those ideas helped you, but I'd love to know what you think. Leave me a comment down and let me know. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. 
If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down. At least leave me a comment why. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button and share this video with someone who you think could benefit from it. All right, to your success, I'm out.